Welcome to the Brain People Podcast, a show where four mental health experts team up to bring you practical tools for overcoming mental health challenges. The Brain People don't replace your doctor or therapist, but we will give you some extra tools to help you on your journey. So join us as we fight mental illness, one episode at a time. Welcome to the Brain People Podcast. My name is Dr. Katie Cruz. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and joining me today is... Dr. Daniel Bynes, and I am a psychiatrist. Awesome. And today we have an exciting topic that will actually be in two parts. And it's talking about a lot of principles all boiled into an acronym. And so we're going to be talking specifically about choose life. And again, it's an acronym. So we'll go through the acronym for you all, but then we'll really break it down uh, letter by letter to talk about these principles that are essential for our mental well-being. So should we just start with... The C, the first one, or yeah. let's break, maybe let's break down the entire one so people know what they're looking forward to. And then we'll focus in on choose for today's episode. Perfect. Yeah. So uh, now it's my pop quiz time. Make sure yes. I got these uh, ones right. So choose, the C stands for connection, the H. Maybe we should go back and forth. Yeah, we'll quiz yeah, you we too. Can. See yeah. if you got this. <laughs> so H stands for hydration. Very good. The first O stands for optimism. The second for oxygen. The S for self control. And then the E is that I always get confused with the double letters. Is that one exercise? Yes. Okay. The first There's another E's, E. Yes. yes, that's true. And then the L is a light. Yes. The I is internal clock. And the F is food. And then the other E is environment. You got it. All right. So that's Choose Life. And this is something that uh, a few years ago, uh, some of our uh, staff were trying to figure out a good acronym where we could encompass some of the very holistic uh, elements for supporting good, optimal mental health. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we love this acronym because inherent in it is the term choice and of course mm-hmm. life and uh, we want people to choose life and it really has a lot to do our day-to-day choices have to do with how good our mental health is and mm-hmm. how much of a vibrant life we can live and so that's uh, why we love this acronym and it's a great way for all of us to remember the basic things that can really help us mm-hmm. on our journey yeah, I love the acronym. I think it's really helpful. One, acronyms help us remember things better. And then it's a lot of different principles. And then especially, I think, as you mentioned, with the choice element of encouraging people that there are things that we can do. Because a lot of times in, with mental health, I know for my clients, they can start feeling helpless and hopeless about their situation. So there are things that we can do um, to improve our mental well-being. So Absolutely. And especially w- if we might have like genetic predispositions mm-hmm. to mental health problems, or maybe we've experienced significant trauma, difficult stressors in our life, it can be easy for us to be in a mentality where we might feel like, man, I can't help it. I have like depression, anxiety, or other mental health problems and there's not much I can do. But the good news is there are a lot of things we can actually choose uh, to make Mm -hmm. a big difference in our long-term mental health outcome. Yeah. So let's get started. C, a very important health principle for us. Yes. So C meaning connection. Now, I'll have to say that uh, this one we could I could easily talk about for mm-hmm. an hour or two mm-hmm. because it's so profound and there's so many elements to this. Uh, but one thing that I've found is that even in the research, this is the one that makes the biggest difference more mm-hmm. than anything else. And yes, of course, all these other elements, hydration, exercise, nutrition, all that is extremely important. But all of that doesn't really matter so much if you don't have connection. Mm. And the studies actually show that. It's amazing, um, you know, in the last several decades, uh, some of the research that's come out uh, related to to connection, um, one of the uh, lead uh, cardiologists uh, back in the 1990s, uh, his name is Dean Ornish, and he he was doing research on how to reverse uh, cardiac disease, mm. and so he was looking at you know he came up with this very holistic program, and he looked at exercise and he integrated that, and he integrated healthy diet and all these things. 
But there was also another element to his program, and that was uh, an element of support and connection for people. Mm -hmm. And as he started to do the research and he started to look at the results of his own uh, work with people and reversing heart disease, uh, he came to an astounding uh, conclusion. Uh, he actually wrote a book called Love and Survival. Mm -hmm. And in his book, one of his main key tenets of the whole book, he said, you know, I don't know of anything in medicine, not genetics, not smoking, not uh, uh, diet, not exercise, uh, not mm -hmm. stress that has a bigger impact on mm -hmm. quality of life and longevity and overall health than does connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, I think about the research that's done on like loneliness, right? And how they say it's like equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day, mm -hmm. right? It's like something like that having even a physical impact on our bodies. And so we see how essential connection is. Absolutely. Yeah, and I see it, you know, every day in our patients. I see it in my own life too. You know, mm -hmm. when I don't have the time to connect with um, people that are meaningful to me, when I don't have a time to connect with God, mm -hmm. um, when I'm not being filled, because connection, it's, it, it is about, yes, giving, but it's also about receiving. Mm -hmm. and, and I think there, there's uh, so much to that. And, and it's, a, it's a beautiful thing because now as the science has evolved, what we find is that we're starting to understand some of the um, reasons that connection is so powerful. And one of the big mediators seems to be uh, the role of oxytocin, mm -hmm. actually. And, and so when we, when we look at uh, oxytocin, what that does is it, it tends to have a calming effect and mm -hmm. be anti-stress on the body. And it actually move, helps substantially in the healing process. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, there was, there was one study uh, that they did where they looked at um, stem cells in the body. So stem cells are cells that have not differentiated into anything yet. So they're just mm -hmm. kind of sitting there being like, okay, what do you want me to do? Mm -hmm. And so when these stem cells uh, were exposed to oxytocin, and this was in the context of, of um, b bone, so then they actually uh, formed new bone cells. But on the other hand, when oxytocin was not available, those same stem cells turned into, guess what? Bat cells, mm -hmm. adipocytes. Mm -hmm. And again, it just shows that even on a cellular level, mm -hmm. we are wired to connect. And when we receive that connection and the oxytocin is released in response to the connection, this actually even motivates our very cells, mm -hmm. you know, us on a cellular level to, mm -hmm. to build and to develop into um, healthy human beings rather than like, bumps on the log. And, you know, of mm -hmm. course, we know that the obesity epidemic has a lot to do with diet and being sedentary, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But I think there's also something mm -hmm. to be said for the contributing factor of loneliness mm -hmm. because loneliness has been on the rise in a huge way in the United States and mm -hmm. actually in the Western world over mm -hmm. the last several decades. Yeah, and if you think about depression, anxiety, trauma, and so forth, there's almost this desire for isolation, this craving of um, whether to self-protect or to, you know, to alienate ourselves to, you know, not have to connect because it takes up energy or for other reasons, many different reasons, but the very thing that is needed to benefit, to um, help with the healing process is what we're fighting against um, yeah. in those conditions. So it's really important for C, right, the Choose Life to connect. And even if you don't feel like it, to start making that choice for connection. Well, and that's a really good point that I think you're bringing up because there are a lot of barriers that can get in the way. And one of them is, yeah, like you said, those predisposing you know, mental health conditions. Maybe you know, we're feeling anxious or we're feeling depressed that then we don't feel like it or we're scared what other people might think of us or what have you. Um, but sometimes knowing that even if I don't feel like it, but it will help me if mm -hmm. I can get over that hump can mm -hmm. be a big help. And, and, you know, sometimes we need to get some extra support to do that. Mm -hmm. And that there's no shame in that. And mm -hmm. that's why a professional can be helpful. Or maybe we do have like a family member or someone that we can trust that says, okay, you know what, let's, let's get out there and meet some people. And then we're like, okay, I'm kind of scared to do it, but Mm -hmm. I'll venture out there because yeah. I know ultimately it will help. Yeah, and specifically healthy connection, right? Yes. And we could do a whole podcast on that, but 
Um, a lot of people are afraid of connection because they've been burned or um, they've been hurt by other people. And so when they sometimes hear in therapy like, oh, I need connection, and then they open themselves too much, right? And it's important to try to find healthy connection uh, with individuals that can, as you mentioned, that mutual giving and receiving. Absolutely. And I so appreciate that you bring that up. And I think that is why a lot of people are hesitant because they have been burned before and they haven't learned how to really establish consistent, uh, healthy boundaries mm-hmm. in new relationships. And so one of the things that I often encourage people to look at before they just get out there and try to connect with a, who, whoever, you know, because, oh, connection is good for me because, you know, bad connection can be more harm than good Mm -hmm. is, okay, well, what does it look like to have healthy boundaries Mm -hmm. and learning that? And then also um, there's a great book uh, by Cloud and Townsend that's called Safe People. Mm -hmm. And it's not just what are good boundaries, but also what are the types of people that we're looking for to uh, that would be safe to open up to and connect with? And which ones do we want to say, well, you know what? Um, I can be an acquaintance, but maybe not mm-hmm. really open my heart to this person yeah. because they're not trustworthy. So there's kind of those different levels of, of trust mm-hmm. that we sometimes think about. Yeah, and there are different episodes that we already have That's true. <laughs> on uh, boundaries or narcissism and so forth. So Yes. So yeah, I know we could talk a lot mm-hmm. about connection. Maybe we should go on to you. Yes. Hydration, right? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, hydration is um, something that people think of almost oversimplistically sometimes. Uh, but what I will say is that a lot of us easily get dehydrated without even realizing mm-hmm. it. And uh, there are uh, studies that even show that um, people because they become chronically dehydrated and they're not used to uh, drinking enough water, well, the brain even starts to rewire mm-hmm. uh, the the perception of thirst with a feeling of hunger. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of us, when we're thirsty, will actually feel hungry Mm -hmm. (laughs) because we've mistrained our bodies not to really be aware that we need to be drinking more. And uh, one of the things that I I encourage a lot of my patients and I try to do myself is, you know what, why why even mess around? Why not just first thing when you wake up, Mm -hmm. just indulge in several glasses of water Mm -hmm. and and, because that can just rehydrate our body, our cells Mm -hmm. and can make it a lot easier to stay hydrated throughout the day Mm -hmm. uh, rather than trying to play catch up throughout the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know for many of my clients struggling with concentration, attention, a lot of it is just due to the fact they're not drinking enough water. And so we can see the impact that water has, yes, of course, on our bi- on our body as a whole, but especially on our mind. And I often tell my clients, you know, if our brain's almost 80% water, don't you think it needs water to sustain itself and to function? You know, it's kind of like oil to a machine. Like you need it in order to have good ability to think. Absolutely. Simple, but don't forget it, right? Mm-hmm. And, and the other piece of this is people often want to know, how much water do I need mm-hmm. to drink? And- in reality, it's that is a difficult question to answer because there's so many variables mm-hmm. that come into play here. So, you know, a general rule of thumb is that you take your body weight in pounds and then cut it in half, and then that's how many ounces uh, you should drink in a day. So, for example, um, let's see, I weigh around 180 ish. Yeah, so we'll just say ballpark 180. So then I would cut that in half. And that would be 90 ounces. And so that's about what I should be drinking per day. Now, that being said, there's a lot of variables there because Mm -hmm. there might be some days I'm getting more exercise. Mm -hmm. There might be some days I'm outside more. Mm -hmm. There might be some days I'm inside almost all day. So when we're outside, when we're exposed to heat, uh, when we're exercising more, when we're breathing more heavily, all of these things Mm -hmm. will increase our hydration needs. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, if we're more sedentary, you know, not breathing as much, um, indoors in a controlled environment, we're not going to need as much Mm -hmm. water. Yeah. One tip that often comes up when we talk about drinking more water for my clients is they say, I always forget. And so one thing that I tell them that has worked for a lot of them is just start putting water bottles or cups in places that you are um, at, you know, frequently. So if they're at the TV a lot, just put a couple water bottles when you're there. If you're driving in the car a lot, 
put some in the car. And so it's making it easier to drink water because it is, if it's not a habit yet, it can be difficult to drink water. Absolutely. Um, so just putting, you know, water bottles or cups in places, it, you know, like you mentioned, first thing in the morning, put it by your bedside. Do things that can make it easier because it can be difficult to even just think about drinking water in the first place. Yeah. But once you establish that habit, uh, you start seeing the difference. And mm -hmm. like you said, it really does impact energy levels, uh, concentration, and there's even studies that show that it can induce depressive symptoms mm -hmm. uh, when people are dehydrated. Um, one other real quick thing about hydration is the external use of water. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we just think about drinking water, but um, the external use is also important, of course, it helps us stay clean, which is very important. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but uh, there's another element that um, has been given more attention here recently, which is hydrotherapy, or some people call it um, cold plunges that they do. So mm. in other words, like hot and cold treatments. And some people just seem like they do the cold, but I like to do the good, get good and hot first mm -hmm. and then do cold. So basically uh, what data is starting to show is that there is significant uh, benefit both physically and mentally mm -hmm. for doing what we call contrast showers or contrast water water treatment. So basically you get good and warm first. Um, and, and I like to do that uh, just by getting really good and hot either in a hot tub or a sauna or a um, shower. Mm -hmm. And so you get nice and hot and then do really cold. And people do that in all sorts of different environments. You can do it straight in your shower, which is something I do every morning. Mm -hmm. um, or you can do it, uh, some people do it, you know, in, in the Arctic ice, <laughs> you know, in, in very cold situations. Um, and that's even more extreme. Uh, some people get these cold plunge uh, tubs that they can use. Uh, but you can keep it pretty simple and even do it in the shower or, or mm -hmm. a bathtub. And that contrast uh, really increases the immune system. It mm -hmm. increases endorphins, uh, neurotransmitters transmitters like serotonin, et cetera. And so that's a wonderful way to use water as well. Yeah, and DBT, we actually, there's a, a tip called TIP and the T stands for tipping the temperature. Mm. And they recommend a you know, bowl of cold, ice cold water and you, you hold your breath and you plunge your face into it oh, wow. as a quick way to <laughs> regulate really intense emotions. Yeah. And so it's definitely something that um, is needed for emotion regulation as well. Yeah. And I know that we actually have an episode from with Shayna, who does the hydrotherapy here at Beautiful Minds Wellness, who talks a little bit more about hydrotherapy. Absolutely. Yeah, so it's a great thing. And I, I love that with the DBT because it's kind of like sometimes when we have a really intense emotion, doing something else that's intense but healthy mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> can help to regulate that intense emotion. Yes, Shall we go on to the first O? Yes. So optimism. Uh, so this is something that uh, Dr. Katie, I think you can especially speak to as a therapist, but obviously I deal with it every day too in the in my work with patients and even in my own personal life. And that mm -hmm. is really keeping an optimistic outlook. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I think about when it comes to optimism, uh, a couple of things, gratitude and then cognitive behavioral mm -hmm. therapy. And I think in a lot of ways, those two things go hand in hand. But mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know if you have any comments that you'd want to make from a therapeutic perspective. Yeah, I, I remember reading this one um, research study who they asked the, the client to do like a gratitude journal. And the, the thing that really stood out to me was even people who did not find things to be grateful for, but just had the action of looking, mm -hmm. they also showed more benefit than those who didn't do it at all. And that really taught me that optimism, it's a choice that you make that helps even if things are not going well for you. Right. It just and and it talked about specifically your brain is rewired in a way that it starts looking for things and then seeing it more quickly, which makes sense. Of so I I can see clients who have a brain that's really wired to negativity, mm -hmm. right? And then those individuals that may not be that they are depressive, you know, they're depression free, but they in those circumstances, they're still looking for the good. Um, and yeah, you can just see the effects of a choice of optimism in people's lives. Yeah, I really like that, especially because it shows that gratitude and optimism really, they are, it is a journey. You know, it's mm -hmm. not, it's not that, oh, you know, you're just either good at it or you're not good at it, but you can teach yourself to become 
more apt to find the good. Mm -hmm. And in so doing, even the process of looking for, like you said, Mm -hmm. starts to improve outlook and starts to improve our mental health. And yeah, yeah, it reminds me of another study too, where they simply, psychologists simply had people sit down. It was was called the three good things uh, study. And basically they were to, at the end of every day, and this was just a week long, uh, they were to look for three good things from that day and mm-hmm. write it down. Mm-hmm. And and so at the end of the day, they wrote down those three good things and why, and they showed significantly uh, improved uh, mood and I believe anxiety as well, mm-hmm. just at the end of, of one week. Mm-hmm. When I used to work with patients in the hospital setting with palliative care, I was so amazed by you know, different patients having different diagnoses and different prognoses of even short term, like three months or six months. And there were some that they'd go in and say, oh, you know, go meet with them because they just got this diagnosis or this prognosis. And some would teach me, like would it be rebuked really of, hey, they have this diagnosis and they'd say something like, you know, I've really seen how it's brought my family together. Wow. My sister, my brother, they wouldn't have come together without this. And, you know, it's it's sad that it's happening and I don't want it to happen, right? Because it's realistic, not overly positive, but they were always optimistic. And we would always see, and this research also supports this, that their prognosis would be better from optimism and gratitude. That's amazing. And I just, I can't help but ask a follow-up question there. Did you find any common denominators that helped people be at that point where they were actually able to yeah, find that silver lining and be positive mm-hmm. even in the midst of a very difficult prognosis? So I would say the most consistent was faith. And when I say faith, I mean a very strong connection with God and an understanding of their contribution to a higher purpose and meaning. And so they're very grounded. So whenever storms storms would come, including a diagnosis, they're like, I know who I am. I have peace of my relationship with with God and with my family. And so it allowed them to not focus on the circumstance itself, but look at the bigger picture. And so I would say that was the most consistent. And then others who may not have had a, sh- a particular faith, but had a deep sense of meaning in life and yeah. were very intentional about seeking that meaning in their lives. Yeah, and I can see how you, with both, there is a lot of meaning that can come. Like Because when we're grounded and connected and we have that faith that somehow this there's a greater purpose and good can come out of this, then it's like, okay, I'm, I, I, I'm trusting that there is meaning in this, that there's a reason and that uh, there is good that can come. And that there's there's a lot to be said there. So yeah, mm-hmm. thank you for sharing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and just to touch real quick on the cognitive behavioral therapy element, I always want to remind our listeners, if you're looking for therapy, it's not like this is the only kind of therapy that can be useful, but it does have the greatest evidence base uh, in treating uh, most mental health disorders, including mm-hmm. things like uh, depression, anxiety, uh, OCD, et cetera. And, and I believe that as because it really does foc- focus on uh, challenging those negative thoughts mm-hmm. and really looking at what are the beliefs that are driving those and how can we shift our perspective mm-hmm. to th- see things you know, more optimistically. It doesn't mean like everything's happy. Yeah, there are sad things in life. There are difficult things in life. But again, how can we look at those in a way that brings meaning, in a way that brings a positive perspective perspective and um, brings us hope in the end and helps us to move forward and and feel mm-hmm. like we have the ability to um, make some sort of change or difference um, even the even if there's circumstances that we can't control we can still choose how we respond to mm-hmm. that because if you really think about it realistically there are always more good things that are happening than bad. Yes, It's when we're caught in the bad itself that it doesn't seem that way. Even clients that tell me, oh, there's nothing good in my life. And and I'm a little hesitant to ask, but I say, you know, if you were to give a percentage of some experiences you have of joy and so forth, they are able to recognize in a whole day, right? When they say, oh, my day was horrible. It's not the whole day. There's actually so much good in that day. Um, and the bad just sprinkles. It's kind of like the minority speaks yes. louder than the majority. Yeah. Absolutely. So it is easier to be optimistic yeah. in the sense of reality wise, um, there is a lot of evidence for optimism. Absolutely. It just takes that intentionality and that practice, mm-hmm. I think. Okay. So our second O 
is oxygen. Yes. So oxygen, now I, I actually did a, a full hour presentation just last week on uh, breathing. So there's a lot we could, we mm-hmm. could talk about with uh, the importance of oxygenation and how to oxygenate our tissues. Um, but one of the things that I'll say very briefly is that as, I, as I've done a relatively deep dive on this topic and looked at the different data, um, very interestingly, and, and this has literally changed the way that I exercise, uh, key to getting optimal oxygenation of our brain and our body is nasal breathing. Mm-hmm. And so many individuals, and even myself included, well, while I was exercising at least, uh, would be mouth breathers. And mm-hmm. there's so many downsides to breathing through the mouth. Uh, one of the major ones is that we don't, well, well, let me put it this way. When we breathe through the nose, uh, you get a lot more nitric oxide uh, being released. And nitric oxide will uh, increase the uh, amount of oxygen carrying capacity of our blood because basically it uh, dilates the blood vessels. And so more there can be more air exchange. And so more air can get into our bodies. Uh, so that's one reason. Another big reason is when we breathe through our, our mouth, basically it collapses, it creates a lot less negative pressure. And so the, the uh, tissues in the back of the throat tend to collapse. And so when you breathe through the nose, on the other hand, it creates kind of this, this vacuum in our, in our lungs. And so then that makes the, the tissues in the back of our throat and our soft palate uh, contract more. And so there, it opens up the airway a lot more as well. And so um, what they find is that when people that are exercising, for example, are doing nasal breathing versus mouth breathing, uh, that uh, they are able to exert themselves longer mm. and their breathing rate starts to go down. Mm. So they did one study, uh, for example, where they were having people only breathe through their mouth while they were uh, exercising on on stationary bikes. And then they uh, had another group uh, that was... Um, and I think it was actually the same people, but they repeated it when they were only mm. breathing through their nose. And what they found is you know, the ones that were breathing through, or when they were breathing through their mouth, their respiratory rate went up significantly. Mm. As they were exerting themselves breathing through their nose, as they were exercising, paradoxically, their respiratory rate actually started to drop. Mm. So it's very interesting that you start to be able to breathe a lot more efficiently mm. and there's much more of a calming effect um, as well. The other thing with um, mouth breathing is that you tend to breathe out too much uh, carbon dioxide. And so, mm. interestingly enough, it's not just how much oxygen we're breathing in, but it's also the level of carbon dioxide in our blood too. So I'll, mm. I'll pause there for, for a minute because I know I just said a whole lot. Mm-hmm. Um, but Katie, I know you're an exerciser too. Um. <laughs> yeah, so I, I exercise too. It's a little bit challenging for me because I have some other issues with my my nose. <laughs> but yeah, it, you can definitely for running, right? It's more beneficial to use your diaphragm mm-hmm. um, for, for running. I know for my clients, one thing that I, from a like a mental standpoint too, is thinking that with anxiety specifically, you're turning on the sympathetic nervous system, mm-hmm. right? By hyperventilating. And a lot of times we are, especially with panic attacks or other things related, we want to try to gasp for more air. And the way that we actually tell our brain that we're safe is by doing the opposite, Mm -hmm. right? What the parasympathetic nervous system needs. And so slow, deep breaths in through our nose, out through our mouth is essential even from a reducing anxiety standpoint um, to tell your brain you're safe. You don't need to hyperventilate. You don't need to huff and puff, slow breathing. And I think even just taking a slow approach to breathing also tells your brain, hey, you can just pause and relax for a moment. Absolutely, yeah. And it's interesting because just 
a note on that slowing down the breathing, that actually allows the carbon dioxide levels to go up a little bit, which is good. Uh, people think, oh, you know, we don't need the CO2, we only need the oxygen. But when we allow the carbon dioxide levels to go up a little bit in the bloodstream, it does what we call, it shifts the oxygen dissociation curve. So what that means is that oxygen will more efficiently be delivered to our body's tissues. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I know... Um, we could say a lot more, but let's mm -hmm. go on to the... Just a quick yes, comment. Yes. <laughs> one thing that people forget that helps with deep breathing is posture. Yeah, that's true. So I tell people one quick way that you can start throughout the day having better oxygen is just by posture alone. Because um, I think some people are like, okay, I'll pause and I'll do deep breathing exercises. But the more that you can have it throughout the day, the more benefit um, long-term. So Absolutely. Yes. Okay, let's go on. So S... Self-control. Uh, so this is one that I think gets a bad rap because uh, a lot of times we think of self-control and we're like, that's boring because that's basically, I'm telling myself I can't do what I want to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the reality of self-control is saying no to those things that will not be so beneficial to us so that we're, by and by saying no to that, we're actually saying yes to mm -hmm the other things that are going to be truly health, healthy and beneficial and make us happier in the long run. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of, and I'm probably going to butcher it, but uh, Abraham Lincoln says something along the lines of self-discipline is choosing between what you want most and what what you want now. Mm. And, I, and I love that because it really puts into perspective what you just said of self-control is not denying and saying, oh, I can't do this, I can't do that. But it's really saying, what do I want most long-term? I tell my clients, think about certain addictions or things that you really like, right? Instant gratification. Think about easy now, right? It does help with your ignoring your emotions and so forth, but hard later. Self-control is hard now, but easier later. And so it's just, you have the choice to choose. Exactly, yeah. And- when we look, start looking at it that way, I think it can start to give a lot more motivation for change. Because mm -hmm. you know, when we're talking about changing things that, that are habits and things that maybe we thought were giving us a lot of pleasure and we liked for a while, but now we realize, uh oh, maybe it's mm -hmm. harmful for me in the long run. That can be difficult, and it requires a lot of motivation and and strength to to change. But at the same time, when we realize that, okay, in the long run, this is actually going to make my life so much better and I'm, I'm going to be a lot happier, I think that can be a very motivating factor to say, okay, I, it's it's worth the struggle, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm willing to get the help. And of course, I'm talking about addictions to substances, yes, but I'm also talking about maybe even other addictions, whether it's uh, to food or mm -hmm. other areas of self control that we struggle with. Maybe it's with uh, gaming or you know uh, media um, relationships. Other, relationships, right? So mm -hmm. self control is a big umbrella, and there's mm -hmm. a lot to be said there. But again, I want to emphasize that I think. Self control, it really goes along with the first letter of our acronym, which is the C, the connection. In other words, when we don't try to do it just all on our own, but mm -hmm. when we're willing to say, yes, this is worthwhile me getting help, there's no shame. Like we all struggle with different areas of self control. Let me reach out for support and help. This is where we can get a lot of strength to actually move through the change process. Mm -hmm. And there's so much joy in accomplishing a self. Right, and mastery of self. Yes. Um, in the moment, it's difficult, but when I talk to people, when they finally accomplish, you know, said goal or overcome an addiction, they are so much happier because they recognize that they were able to conquer that. They were able to, and self is so. Um, we're so resilient. We're so capable, and we don't challenge ourselves enough. And so I think if we just give ourselves the opportunity to give self-control a chance, um, it'll long-term um, really give us a joy. And um, I think it'll also boost self-confidence in other areas that are really important for mental health as well. Absolutely. It, it really is worth it, even though it's a, a struggle. Mm -hmm. So, all right, well, let's go to the final letter of the choose part, at least. And that is our first E, which is exercise. So... Exercise is one of those things that I tell people when they come through our intensive outpatient program, for example, mm -hmm. uh, this will jumpstart your mm -hmm. mental health quicker than anything else because mm -hmm. it's almost instantaneous. And yeah, you know, the first 
few days that people start exercising regularly, they can feel a little more fatigued afterwards because you're mm-hmm. not used to it and you're potentially going to be all sore and you're probably releasing some toxins and this sort of thing. But what it does immediately is it improves blood flow. And that's mm-hmm. huge because when we improve the uh, b- blood flow, not only to our body's tissues, but also to our brain, this is uh, setting the, the 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 stage for neuroplasticity, you know, mm-hmm. positive, quick, brain change. And it really allows our brain to go through that process of not only uh, changing rapidly, but being able to kind of fire and work on all uh, cylinders where there's neural circuits that are being activated and fed uh, so they can work uh, better. Especially uh, studies have shown that specifically the frontal lobe really lights up when we Mm. do uh, cardiovascular exercise. And the frontal lobe has to do with uh, self-control that we just talked about. It has Mm. to do with concentration, with managing our emotions properly. And there's a lot of studies that show that exercise is just as good as medications for a lot of mental Mm. health. Mm-hmm. disorders. Yeah, one thing that I emphasize with um, within DBT because people experience very intense emotions is our body is in constant, you know, sympathetic nervous system. It's releasing cortisol, it's releasing adrenaline and so forth. And exercise is a good um, kind of remedy for that in the sense of we were meant to, if we see a bear, or we see, well, you're not supposed to run when you see a bear, but <laughs> some sort of danger, right? And you're supposed to run away. So our body was built in a way that you respond naturally with exercise to mm-hmm. stress and danger. And so it's helping your body say, okay, let's release that That's in right. a healthy way, in a way that stresses your body, which is interesting how exercise works. It stresses your body, but then it brings it back to equilibrium afterwards. And yes. so people who struggle with intense emotions Intense exercise as a quick little uh, kind of skill or thing to implement in that moment can help bring them back down. Yeah, there was actually a study that uh, was done that showed clearly that you know exercise does increase cortisol levels, but mm-hmm. it does it only transiently. Mm-hmm. And because of that, it allows people to become then more resilient to future mm-hmm. stressors, whether they're emotional or physical or what have you. Mm-hmm. So it goes right along with what you're saying. It's a great way to channel that stress, if you will, into something positive and then make us more resilient for the future. Mm-hmm. Now, someone might ask, because I get this question a lot with like intense exercise specifically and in response to intense emotions, but is there a recommendation for how much exercise or um, the intensity of exercise on a regular basis? So the general recommendations are ideally at least 150 minutes per week of uh, moderate intense exercise. So in in that, you know, you're going to have a little bit of breathlessness, um, maybe a little bit of uh, tiredness um, while you're exercising, uh, but uh, it's not that heavy exertion where you you know really are just like almost feeling like you're completely out of breath or something like that. Um, if it's vigorous in- intensity exercise where you're really like going, your heart rate is quite high, and you're really exerting yourself. Um, you only need about 75 minutes per week of that mm-hmm. uh, to, to get pretty optimal uh, benefit. Yeah. All right. Well, that's choose, right? And definitely we have a lot more to go through. Um, but just encouragement to hear these principles and to start making some choices um, to make some changes. But you want to tune in for our part two, which then talks about life. And we'll go through that as well and talk a little bit more about the choices that we make that are important for having that vibrant mental health. Thanks for listening. To hear more episodes, find us on social media or support us financially, visit thebrainpeoplepodcast.com. 